All right. So my name is Kara Wilmot and I'm with RMTC DHH and I'll be monitoring the room today for the presenter. Um, I wanna welcome you to this one hour webinar titled Keeping It in Context, Explicit Contextualized Vocabulary Instruction for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. I'm joined today by Dr. Jennifer Catalano from Flagler College. She's the director of the master's program in deaf education. She was also a resource, research assistant with the Center on Literacy and Deafness, CLAD, for five years developing and implementing literacy interventions for kindergarten through second grade students who are deaf and hard of hearing. After the presentation is complete, we will take questions, but you also feel free to um, type some questions as we go along the way. So this presentation is already uploaded on the RMTC DHH TA Live webpage if you wanna download it now or later. That's also where you'll find a certificate if you want to submit that for points in your district. Just to let you know about the Zoom environment, before we begin, you can watch the captions by turning on the captions on the bottom of your screen. We want to make sure and we want to thank Ann Armstrong from Alternative Communication Services for providing our captions today. We want to make sure everyone can contribute to the conversation. So even though your mic is muted, we want to see your questions, comments and thoughts and interact with others in the room through chat. And I believe Jennifer will also have a couple opportunities for you guys to chat um, during the presentation. I will read them aloud to make sure that they are captions. Um, and if you don't see the chat panel, again, click it on the bottom of your screen to, to see the, the chat. Above the field where you enter your text, you'll see a blue drop down menu. You should be able to select everyone if you want to communicate with everyone. I'll be monitoring the chat and dropping links to resources throughout the webinar for Jennifer. Also, all the links that I will be dropping during this webinar will also be in the PowerPoint or um, on our website. So we mentioned in the email notification that this webinar is being recorded and it will be archived on the RMTC DHH TA Live webpage. As a reminder, we do request that you take the post survey for TA Live at the end of the session. We thank you in advance for contributing to our continued self-assessment of work. With all this business done, I wanna welcome Dr. Jennifer Catalano. Thank you, Jennifer, for being here today and I'm gonna turn the mic over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, RMTC, for inviting me to do this. I'm excited to be here with all of you and tell you uh, a little bit more about this exciting vocabulary instruction that I was a part of developing and implementing. So it's a mouthful, explicit contextualized vocabulary intervention for DHH. We call it ECV DHH for short, but that's not a whole lot easier. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, as Kara mentioned, I worked with the Center on Literacy and Deafness, we call it CLAD, for about five years when I was in Tucson, Arizona. And we, this was a multi-university, multi-million, multi-year project, uh, probably one of the largest in our field. We had over 300 uh, deaf and hard of hearing students involved in kindergarten through second grade, as well as uh, teachers and service providers in nine states and even in Canada. So if you want to find out more about CLAD, definitely go to this website and you can uh, click on it. It's in the PDF as well and uh, find out about all of the exciting uh, interventions that we developed. I do have to say that we were funded by an IES grant and this is the grant that supported us. So just a very uh, little bit of information about me. Um, I'm the director of the master's program in education of deaf and hard of hearing at Flagler College. I've been here for a little bit over a year and um, I teach courses in the graduate program and in the undergraduate program. And I've been really enjoying my experience here so far. This is my shameless plug. I have to make sure I tell you a little bit about our graduate program. If anybody out there is interested in getting a master's, we offer an online master's credit, uh, uh, master's program, 30 credits. One of the courses is in person. It's a summer residency for three weeks. Uh, we do have scholarships available and we can really individualize the program to kind of fit your needs. We also have a couple uh, endorsements. So for you folks that are in Florida, uh, who have teaching certification, you can take these uh, courses towards uh, teaching endorsement. If you're outside of Florida though, you can certainly still take these courses and apply them to your own state certification and or also towards national certification. So we offer teaching ASL in the public schools 
and teaching children with severe and profound disabilities as well. Uh, we have a really long uh, website uh, address, so the best thing to do is just Google Master of Deaf Education at Flagler College, and it will come up uh, the first or second in your search. So uh, call me if you have any questions or email me. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about vocabulary instruction, uh, the importance of learning vocabulary, the connections between vocabulary and literacy, and also the components of what makes good vocabulary instruction. And then we'll talk about the intervention that we developed at CLAD, ECVDHH. And we will discuss the components of this intervention, as well as an overview of the steps. So to begin, I'd like uh, for you to share with me, if, you, if you're willing and able, uh, why you think learning vocabulary is important. Just take a moment to think about it. Carrie, we have, how can you read without it? Why do you think learning vocabulary is important? To improve conversations? Mm -hmm. For understanding, oh wait, that went up fast. For understanding communication, it's the foundation for all learning. Comprehension of text. Mm -hmm. Language is everywhere to understand. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Those are some great contributions. Uh, so it, a lot of it is in line what I'm, with what I'm about to say. Why is vocabulary important? Um, some of you may be familiar with the Matthew effect, uh, the proverb, uh, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And we know from research on vocabulary that uh, the more vocabulary you have, the more vocabulary you can learn. Also vocabulary gives us language flex flexibility that enables us to express our thoughts and our feelings and our needs, as well as to uh, engage in higher order thinking skills like inferencing and synthesizing. And we know from research that vocabulary is a predictor of reading comprehension for deaf and hard of hearing students as well as hearing students. So we, it's kind of a duh, right? But I think it's important to, uh, to discuss and, and remember as we dive into this intervention. So this is a whole lot of uh, information on one slide and it's a little bit hard to read, but this is the simple view of reading. Some of you may have seen it before and basically, it is uh, the two main components of reading comprehension. So we have language comprehension, and then we also have word recognition. And together, these two uh, strands of reading lead towards becoming a skilled and fluent reader. And as you can see, vocabulary knowledge is a part of the language comprehension strand. And as these strands are woven together, that's how we, we be that's how we support children in becoming strong readers. It's a nice visual to help us remember that. So basically in a nutshell, vocabulary leads to language comprehension, which then leads to reading comprehension, which then leads to vocabulary growth, right? As we become readers, we have access to more and more vocabulary. The intervention that we developed is actually an expressive and receptive language vocabulary intervention as opposed to a reading intervention, but it provides students with the skills and the, and the vocabulary knowledge that they need uh, to understand those words that they're decoding and coming across and to be able to comprehend. So time to share again. Share why you think uh, deaf and hard of hearing children are at risk for learning age-appropriate vocabulary. Lack of incidental exposure. Ooh, that went fast. <laughs> uh, lack of access to language. Some students may only see language during school hours. Lack of access to language in general and in all aspects of life. Lack of access to language. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Oh, one more. That's People so simplify great. their conversation. Oh, I've seen that one. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have the phonics capability as hearing kids do. Those who know their language are typically adults. So 
So not a lot of peer role models. Mm -hmm. You are all spot on. So uh, why do deaf and hard of hearing children tend to have vocabulary delays? For many deaf and hard of hearing children, they grow up in impoverished vocabulary environments because of possibly having limited access auditorily, visually, by whatever means. They're just not uh, incidentally learning the vocabulary in a typical way. Um, it has to be explicitly uh, learned in many of their situations and taught. Um, also, for families that are choosing ASL as the mode of communication, often the adults are learning this language at the same time as the children. And so we don't have in those situations often the, the best language role models because they're learning it together. And in a lot of cases, the children surpass their parents and their family members uh, at a certain point as far as their vocabulary and language skills. And then somebody mentioned this, uh, some, uh, said something to the effect of uh, adults are, uh, you know, changing their language for children. And that's something, that's an actual thing uh, by Greenberg, and he calls it linguistic overprotection. And what we often do with children who have maybe delayed or limited vocabulary is we, we protect them. We don't, we want to use simpler terms so that they can understand, but by doing that, we shield them from the opportunity to learn more complex and a wide or variety of vocabulary. So it's actually in the end, a disservice to children. It doesn't give them those opportunities to explicitly or incidentally learn the language. So you were all spot on. So th these were the reasons why we thought it was so important to develop a vocabulary intervention. So uh, vocabulary instruction 101, it's important for us to understand what it means to know a word, um, what words should be taught, and then also what are components of good vocabulary instruction. And Kara, if there's any questions as we go along, because I'm not able to see the comments, um, definitely just interrupt me and uh, let me know if uh, there's somebody has a question that I can answer. I right sure will. Thank you. Okay, so what does it mean to know a word? So these are the different levels of what it means to know a word. First, there's recognition. And so in these cases, uh, a child might be able to recognize the word. They aren't able to really attach any meaning to it or uh, understand it in any type of context, but they, they might be able to, to just rec identify it. They might be able to point to a picture of it. And then comprehension is that the child is beginning now to understand the word. And so in this situation, you might be able to give a specific definition or meaning of the word, and the child would be able to point to a picture that represents that definition. And then the next step up is expression, and that's when a, a child or individual is able to say or sign that word in a meaningful way within context. And then of course, generalization is being able to use that word appropriately in lots of different contexts. When we're thinking about word definition and word knowledge, we want to have, we want children and of course adults to have a deeper understanding of the meanings of words. And so this is kind of a, a hierarchy of understanding. And so we begin with really narrow knowledge of a word, right? When we're first introduced to a word, we understand it within the context that we're, we're uh, being taught about it or it's being introduced to us. And then we start to understand it in a more decontextualized way. And so that means we can understand it even when we're not engaged in a conversation about it or having clues around us to what that meaning of that word is. And then a step up from there, of course, is having a multi, you know, understanding of the multiple meanings of vocabulary. And a really great example of this is the word arm, right? So we understand at a very young age that this uh, thing that comes out of our body that our hands are attached to is called an arm, right? But then as we move along, we're able to also know that there are arms on a chair. And so we might be able to talk about arms uh, when we're referring to a body and when we're referring to, uh, to furniture or something like that. And we don't necessarily have to be within that context to understand that the different types of meanings. 
And then of course there's multiple meanings and even knowing not only that an arm can be a part, of, you know, the thing on furniture, but it can also be one of the spokes that comes out of a snowflake. So snowflakes have arms. And so understanding all these different meanings, not just in the context that you're learning it, but also outside of that context. So what words should be taught? And we spent a lot of time researching this and, and we, uh, you know, it was really important to us that we weren't just picking words for no reason. That when we as teachers and service providers are working with children, that we are being purposeful and deliberate in the, in the words that we're choosing to uh, use with children. So first we have these tier one high frequency words. These are your basic general everyday words. Uh, the interesting part about these words is sometimes we make assumptions of, of the tier one words that children who have limited access to language might know. And so even though uh, you might think it's not necessary to teach these words, sometimes it really still is. And it's important to make sure we're incorporating some tier word, one words as well um, into our vocabulary instruction. An example of this is ocean. Now we're here in uh, St. Augustine, Florida, which is right on the coast. And so the funny thing about ocean is it's a tier one word here, but we developed this uh, intervention in Tucson, Arizona, which is landlocked. And so a lot of those children, it's not a part of their general everyday language. And so it might be actually an example of a tier two word which is a more high frequency word, um, kind of more mature words, right? When we think about the 101 different ways to say the word good, right? We try to uh, give uh, children more, uh, more ways to say different words. And so it's not limited to a specific domain or a specific content area, but um, it's definitely more frequently used uh, in our language. And so an example of that would be fierce, right? So we want children to not only use the word mean or angry or strong, we want them to be able to use a word like fierce. But as you can see, fierce is not specific to any one domain. And then of course we have those tier three low frequency words that are really highly specific. And these are the kinds of words that we think about when we're doing content area instruction. So these are our science words and our social studies words and our math words that are really, really specific to that area. Uh, there's no real formula to choosing what these words are. I mean, I think there's some words like anemone that we can all agree on that is probably a tier three word. But like I said, ocean could kind of go tier one or tier two depending on your location. And so we would sometimes have these really uh, rich debates about what kind of uh, word it was. Is it tier one or tier two? And uh, in the end, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is that you're exposing children to a combination of all three tiers and making sure that you're hitting all three levels. So how does this help student read? And like I said, our intervention was a uh, expressive and receptive language vocabulary intervention as opposed to a reading vocabulary intervention. And so our goal was to give students more words. And in doing that, it increases their schemata. So if you think back to your Psych 101 course when you learned about schemata, that's the, you know, the, it, it's in the brain and that's how we develop knowledge. And so we have these schemata that we form as we become familiar with new concepts and words and ideas. And so we wanna increase students schemata by increasing their vocabulary. And then what this does is it decreases their cognitive load. So then when they're reading and they're decoding and they're having to do all these skills all at the same time and comprehending text, and higher order thinking skills, it decreases the load. If they come across a word that they can sound out or they can recognize and they go, I know that word, they may or may not say that, but it's in their brain, it's already schemata, it's already in there, and then they can just move on and they can uh, you know, have a better idea of understanding the text. So this is an example for you. I'd like you to take a um, few moments to kind of read through this and see how you feel about this paragraph.
So uh, this is from a statistics textbook and uh, I took statistics and it still makes me ill to my stomach to kind of have to read through this. Uh, you know, we are all adult uh, people here. And so obviously we're able to recognize a lot of the vocabulary that's in this, in this paragraph. But when we put these words together, we know multiple and we know comparison, but when we put it together as multiple comparison procedure, it may become unfamiliar to us. And so I just wanted to share this little paragraph with you to kind of help you see this is what it's like for our children when they don't have the vocabulary to attach to the meaning. And so they, you know, if you were to read this, eventually you would be able to figure it out. You would have your dictionary or you would have the internet and you could look everything up. By the time you get to the end, you'd be exhausted, right? Because it would have been such a cognitive load on you. And if you just take a moment and you think about this being the experience for some of our learners, our deaf and hard of hearing students every day in every subject, it's exhausting. And this is just for reading. Uh, think about all the other exhausting parts of the day. And so I just, we think it's a really good example to share to kind of drive our point home. Okay, so now it's your turn again. I'd love to hear how you teach vocabulary to deaf and hard of hearing children and what strategies you think are most effective. So I know I personally, when I was in the classroom, used the links strategy from um, University of, I think it's Kansas, Kentucky, the SIM strategies and also word parts strategy. Multiple meaning words with Fairview. Repeated exposure to vocabulary, real world application, role play, pictures, Fairview, graphic and photo support, bedrock literacy, a good one. <laughs> However, I can get it to stick. Yep. <laughs> All right, uh, those are great ideas. I see a couple more coming in, but- um, Lesson you know, picks and visual dictionaries, reading milestones, mm -hmm. typed out stories. So you're gonna see as I, I start to talk a little bit more specifically about the ECV intervention that you're already doing a lot of these things. We did not create something new here. We did not reinvent the wheel. What we did was we, we looked at the evidence-based practices and we pulled from what we, we saw in the research that worked and we kind of put it together and made a package out of it. And so a lot of this you're already doing, a lot of this you're familiar with. Um, it's just about kind of putting it together and being purposeful about it. And so you'll be hearing me use that word purposeful and deliberate a lot throughout this, uh, the rest of the, the presentation. So what are the components of a, a good vocabulary instruction? We found that uh, connecting to a theme really helps children. I'm sure a lot of you are already doing this. Um, and themes are already there, right? They have the standards. They have the things that they need to learn. And so by connecting to theme, they're already learning about the concepts and the ideas and you're able to introduce more vocabulary. Um, includes choosing appropriate words. So we just recently discussed those tier one, two, and three words. It's really important to choose words from all the tiers when you're teaching vocabulary, but also to make sure that you're including different types of words. So you wanna include nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. So having a wide variety of different types of words. Um, providing a child-friendly definition. This is really, really important, right? I mean, who remembers uh, looking up words in the dictionary when you were a kid and writing down the definition and then having to look up five more words because you didn't understand the definition? Uh, we spent a lot of time looking for child-friendly definitions and it's actually easier than you think 
um, even if the definition itself isn't all encompassing, it at least gives a start. And then when you're having conversations about the word, you can elaborate more. But you really want um, the, the definition to be accessible to students. Uh, part of knowing a word means knowing that it has a specific meaning. And then providing multiple exposures and getting students to use the word. Uh, somebody said repetition, right? So repetition, not only of them saying the word, but also, and using the word, but of them hearing or seeing the word being used in lots of different contexts. And then having a nice balance of explicit and implicit instruction. And we're gonna talk about that um, on the next slide. So explicit instruction is intentional and planned, right? We talk about being deliberate and purposeful. In an explicit instruction, we focus on new words, right? So we're focusing on the use of words, both receptively and expressively. We also incorporate metacognitive skills. So this, is, this type of instruction gives you lots of opportunity to talk about how you're learning the new words and how you're understanding them and how you're recognizing them. And it's important for teachers to talk about how they understand words and how they're able to recognize words when they are exposed to them and um, be really explicit about that and help children be able to start talking about the, how they are understanding those new words. And then like we said, repetition, 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 but not just saying the word. Uh, the research shows that just saying the word uh, is not enough. They have to uh, be able to be exposed to that word and then of course, be able to have conversations and discussions about the specific meanings of the word. Which brings us to implicit instruction, which is more contextualized. So this is your incidental learning. This is your talking about words within a content area or a subject or a concept connected to a theme. And then the focus is on the word meanings. So we're talking a lot about the definitions and how that word can be used in all and in different ways and uh, synonyms and multiple meanings and things like that. And this is the type of, this is the approach to learning and vocabulary unconsciously through interaction. So when we think about that incidental learning that many of our children who don't have access in that really critical period from zero to five, uh, they don't have the access at those early on ages. So we have to make them have that access. We have to give them the opportunities to have access with vocabulary, intentional, purposeful, and deliberate. Which brings us to the intervention that we developed at CLAD. So ECVDHH was adapted from an already existing uh, uh, program called Pave for Excess, and there's the picture of the book that talks about it. If anybody can read the second author's name, you get extra points. Um, she has a really long last name, and she's a lovely woman and worked very closely with us as we began to develop our intervention. Her, her program was used with preschoolers who were at risk, so low socioeconomic uh, students. And so um, she, uh, we designed our intervention based on a lot of the principles of her vocabulary program. It was designed for children in grades K through two, so kindergarten, first and second grade. And it's only a supplemental intervention, uh, like many of the interventions that we develop through CLAD. They are not meant to be a curriculum. They are just meant to supplement the, the the students learning as it relates to language and reading. And so it's recommended that you utilize a, this intervention and the components of this intervention for about 20 minutes a day. Uh, we centered the intervention around content area. So it's supposed to be incorporating science vocabulary, social studies vocabulary, and the themes that we are discussing in those areas and it's connected to the standards. Um, it was formally known as V4S, Vocabulary for Success, uh, but it turns out that there is already a Vocabulary for Success program, so we had to change the name. Uh, the new name is not as pretty, 
but uh, it certainly won't get us into trouble. And um, so you will see in some places that it still says V4S. And if it does say that, go, what is this? I've never heard of this. Now you'll know that that is actually ECVDHH. And then of course, uh, CLAD, uh, part of what we did was, you know, not only, uh, you know, have a uh, work with children to assess them and have a better understanding of the needs of deaf and hard of hearing students, but then also we implemented the interventions that we developed. And so we did 13 single study cases uh, with deaf and hard of hearing children with uh, the ECVDHH intervention. Uh, all the students were in grades kindergarten through second grade, and they had a wide range of hearing loss and also a wide variety of communication mode. So this intervention can be used with students who only use American Sign Language, who only use spoken language, or use a combination of spoken and sign language or other, uh, other visual tools or other sign languages. So it's not dependent on any communication mode or any language. It can be used with all children. That's one of the beauties of it. And we did actually use it with all different uh, students uh, with all different needs and all different modes of communication. We found that um, all the students increased their uh, expressive and receptive use of the words, uh, but they also increased their definition knowledge and their understanding of meanings. And we had a very specific scoring system that helped us understand if they had no knowledge of the word, partial knowledge, uh, some knowledge, or full knowledge. And so, um, so that you know, obviously, it's it's a, a range, and there's a progress. And and just like uh, us as adults, we don't we don't know the dictionary definition of lots of words, but we can certainly tell you something about it or give you a synonym for it. And then what we also found, and this was the most exciting part of the research that we did, was that there, there was an increase in the spontaneous use of the words. So we had students do book walks and they would go through the books that we were using and we would say, tell us, tell us, you know, tell us the story. Tell us what you, you know, what you see in the pictures. And, and of course, before the intervention, they never ever use the words because we specifically chose words that they didn't know. And then at the end of the intervention, they were able to use a lot more words. But the most interesting thing was even after that in the maintenance phase, so when we were totally done working with the students and we would come back about four to six weeks later, they used even more of the words. So it was almost like the words were percolating. And then uh, as they had more time, uh, and maybe they were recognizing these words in their classroom or at home or wherever or in the community, they were able to use them more. And so that was one of the most exciting parts of our research. This is the website. And uh, Kara, I'm going to click on the link so everybody can see it. And you can always just do CLAD, uh, ECV, or you know, you can just type in the words if you don't have the link. This is a really great uh, website. It's really easy to use. Uh, talks about you know why we have a why we, you know, instruct on vocabulary and talks a little bit of, about the history of it. And then it will go into the different strategies, which I'm going to talk with you about today. Uh, there are sample units that you can use. We have 14 sample units that you can choose from. You can also create your own units and we give you all the templates and all the tools you need to be able to do that. And then we give you tools to be able to assess students, right? Because obviously assessing them before and after is really important. So we have to progress monitor our students. And then of course you can find out a little bit more about us if you wanted to. So whenever you have the time, definitely take a, a moment to go ahead and, and look at that. Did that show up? I'm thinking maybe that didn't show up. It did not show up. You'd have to have changed what screen you were sharing. Uh, you know what? I have to move it over. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm just going to quickly there. Now, can you see it? No. <laughs> no. Okay. So we're not going to worry about that. Ooh, but that makes me concerned about if we're able to watch the videos. So I may have to uh, figure that one out. Okay, well, we shall move forward and we'll, we'll deal with the videos when we get to the videos. So these are the four components. That's why it used to be called vocabulary for success. 
Uh, there's fast mapping, interactive book reading, conversation, and extension activities. And so this kind of gives you a graphic uh, way to look at uh, how, how we see these different strategies. So we talked earlier about explicit instruction and implicit instruction. And so under explicit instruction is fast mapping, which I'll talk to you more about, uh, extension activities that are drill and practice, and then under ex implicit instruction are the interactive book readings, the teacher-student conversations, and the extension activities that we call conceptual activities. And so prior to instruction, uh, it's important to choose some target words. And these need to be uh, words that they don't know. If you're working with a student one-on-one, -on -one, you definitely wanna choose words that they don't know. If you're working with a group of two or three students, obviously uh, there will be times that some students will know some words and uh, they won't know others. But you just wanna do your best job of choosing words that they don't know, because that's the whole point of it. Uh, you choose the words from the selected books, which we'll talk about in a moment. Again, you want to choose tier one, two, and three words, a combination of all of them, as well as a combination of nouns, verbs, adjectives, and it should also say adverbs as well. Uh, you need to decide on the sign for the word. So if you're working with students who use sign language, it's really important to choose the, the, the appropriate sign for it and to consistently use that sign throughout. Um, sometimes words have to be fingerspelled. And that's okay. Uh, just be consistent in using the finger spelling for the words and you can use strategies like sandwiching where you would finger spell the word and then maybe you would do a sign for it and then finger, finger spell it again. Important to choose a child friendly definition for each word and I have some resources for you at the end of the PowerPoint to uh, locate child-friendly definitions, but you honestly can just Google kid-friendly definitions and you'll come up with a few websites. And then um, you want to screen the students to make sure that the words are unknown. Um, and I'm not sure uh, which slide it's on, but you also want to choose a few known words and that's for the fast mapping activity. And that only happen, has to happen once. We'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a moment. So I am going to click on one of the videos and hope and pray that you all get to see it. Let me know. Ugh, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it. Can you see that? So pause it. You need to, when you do your share, did you okay. choose a, a desktop one or desktop two or did you choose a specific window? Okay, I'm gonna, there we go. All right, are you able to see that? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, we're doing vocabulary screening. And what we do, I show you the picture, and you tell me one word, and then you tell me about the picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is that? A T. A. A. T. A. Before you get in, a corona. Corona T. You can give me a T. And what are they for? What do you do with T? I yield you. Two piece. Two piece, you put it on your shoe flash to um, brush your teeth. And I'm going to turn that over. This is not good for you, but that will be something. Because um, if you eat apples, they help you uh, make your teeth fall. And a dentist. Jennifer, okay. we have a question sure. for a younger child who would, um, for a younger child, would child-friendly definition include an image or how is the definition best presented? Examples for a K through first grade child, please. Yes, so I'm going to show you some of the picture cards in a little bit, um, but definitely always having a picture attached to it. And uh, we kind of went back and forth uh, about including the words and the definitions on the cards. And that's really your preference. Um, I think for younger children, it may not be as necessary, 
For older children, it's really nice to have it there because why not, right? Um, but really, is, it's kind of your preference. If you think there's too many words on the card that might be distracting to a student, it might be better to just have the picture in the words, something like that. And so it's really kind of your preference, but you'll see some examples of it actually really soon. Um, just making sure you're able to see the PowerPoint again. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. okay, good. Okay. So from that video, you can see uh, that that was actually a student that we uh, had to uh, bring in just for recording for presentations because we could include obviously any of the students from our study. Um, I would not have chosen any of those words for her to target because she had a pretty, she knew the words and had a pretty good definition for all of them, but it kind of shows you how we did it. We asked, what is this? And then it was, you know, tell me a little bit more about her or what does that mean? Or give me a definition. Uh, you want to, you know, ask them to elaborate on the word. And if you notice for the word healthy, she didn't say, what is this? She said, this is, I can't remember exactly. This is not good for you. This is, so sometimes you have to come up with a more explicit response than what is this, because you want them to say something specific. And, and that's usually true for the adjectives and the verbs and the adverbs. So um, something to think about uh, as you're developing uh, the components of the intervention and the cards. And so uh, we're gonna be using, even though the videos are a dental unit, uh, all of my other examples are a, an ocean unit. And so um, these are the two books that we had uh, that we included. And it's important to use a um, expository book as well as a narrative book. And if you can't find uh, one of each, uh, go with two expository uh, if that's, you know, works best for you. And so you find the books and then you select the words from the, the books. Sometimes you can find the words in both books. If you can't, that's okay. Um, at least, you know, at least they're in one of the books. So these are some examples of words that we used in our ocean unit. And uh, if you want, just take a, a moment and can you guess the tier for each word? Ocean, urchin, dim, fierce, which I already gave you, and coral. And so this is what we determined were the tiers. And like I said, uh, there's no necessary rhyme or reason for it, except, uh, you know, it feels like it's that kind of word and it's not so important. What's important is that you're using a variety of these different types of tiers. So the fast mapping is a term that we use to describe the speed and ease with which young children learn new words. And it helps students attach meaning to a new word when it's presented. So I'm gonna skip ahead to the next slide so you can see what it looks like. So these were examples of word cards. And as you can see, ball and banana were the known words. And like I said, it's important to screen the students on the known words. You only have to do that one time. Once you know what the no, uh, those known words are, you can just keep using them again and again. Um, even as you move along and do more, learn and teach more vocabulary, you can start using some of the older words, like once they learn urchin, that can become a known word. And so basically what you do is you say, which is the urchin? And they of course will point to this one, uh, especially because it has the definition right there. And you say, how did you know that? And you model for them, you know this is a ball and this is a banana, so this has to be an urchin. And the nice part about the fast mapping is that it really gives the students a feeling of confidence and it also gives them, you know, an explicit introduction to the new words. All right. Are you able to see it? Yes. Awesome. Okay. 
So not only does the teacher introduce the word and get the student to be thinking about how they know it, but they also uh, give the definition. So the interactive book reading, um, you start with a book walk. Um, we read each book twice, and then you ask three questions per reading, competence, abstract, and relate. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. It's really important to include the target words either in the question or potentially in the answer to the question. So the target is always to get the students exposed to the word or using the word. You wanna write the questions on a sticky note, and I don't know if you can see my little sticky notes right here, and you go right to the page, you know, as you're reading, you don't forget to read your question. And then as you're reading, you also wanna draw attention to the new word. So if one of the words is in your book that you're reading, uh, you wanna, you know, emphasize it, and the student might go, oh yeah, that's one of my new words. And so, um, and also you wanna display those word cards out, and you'll see that as they interact with their words more, they'll start pointing to the word card and making extra connections. These are the three different types of questions. Um, I'm not gonna show the videos because I can just show you the examples here, but uh, the answers are found in the book for competence questions. So they're, e they're right there. They're either in a picture or in the text. An example might in Swimmy might be, where do all these animals live? An abstract question requires that inferences need to be made. Uh, you might say, looks like those fish are hiding in some coral. Why do you think they are hiding there? So the answer is not right in the book. You're asking the student to think. And then relate questions, relate the, uh, the, the words to the student's experience. Those little fish made one big fish to hide. Tell me about a time you played a game where you hide. And so those are the different types of questions. And another component of our intervention is conversation. And this provides opportunities for the students and the teacher to use the target words and express new, the new concepts, gives the teacher an opportunity to model complex language, and gives the teacher an opportunity to, to expand the student's language. Uh, the prompt should elicit the use of the target word. That's really important. You want your prompts to be open-ended questions or tell me statements. For example, in the book, how could Swimmy make friends with an urchin without getting poked? Or I went to the beach last weekend and swam in the ocean. Tell me about a time you went to the ocean and you can see urchin and ocean are in our, our uh, prompts. It's helpful to have a prop. So you can have an object, maybe you can bring in um, some coral or a picture of an ocean, or bring in a short video that you can show on your iPad or computer, or even just have the book, you know, just have Swimmy right in front of you and open it up to a specific picture. Jennifer, we had a question. Sure. Um, is it important to read the book twice or is it three times better? Is the reading twice allowed with the child or once allowed and one the child to him or herself? Uh, so you're always reading the books to the children, because remember, this is not a reading intervention. This is a language intervention. So that's a great question. So we always read the book twice. First, we did a book walk and then read each book twice. Um, but they would not be reading it. They, these are going to be uh, books that are probably at their frustration level, uh, books that they would not necessarily read on their own. So great question. Um, conversation is really hard. Uh, it's hard because a lot of times our students don't necessarily know how to have conversations. And so not only are you trying to teach them the vocabulary through a conversation, you might be teaching them how to have a conversation and how to take turns. So um, here are the strategies that we use. There's contributions, which, you know, if they say, I went to the ocean, you go, I went to the ocean last weekend with my family too. Open-ending questions, which we already talked about. You can ask them not only as the prompt, but as the conversation is going. More tell me statements. So they say, yeah, I saw an urchin at the aquarium. You can say, tell me more about that. Vocabulary recasts are when they are describing something and then you say it back to them, but you add the word to it. And I have an example of that on the next slide. Acknowledgements could be like, ah, oh, or yeah, right, I know, things like that, just to kind of keep the conversation going. Linguistic expansions are uh, if the ch child says something and you expand it either syntactically, grammatically, 
voc uh, related to vocabulary. You're just, you're expanding what they're saying. So you're not correcting them, but you're providing them with a model. And then following the student's lead. Uh, sometimes they're gonna go off topic and that's okay. You might be able to incorporate some of that vocabulary. So again, these are the different um, types of, of strategies that we use and some more examples. I'm gonna move a little bit quickly through it just so we can get to our other components. But like I said, conversation is challenging. So if you see that your student is having a hard time with them, here are some things that you can do. You can break down the content. Uh, the student may not understand what you're asking. And so you might start with a yes, no question and then uh, add on, uh, you know, tell me more about that and that's okay. You can give an example um, of what you're talking about from your own experience or maybe one from their own experience. You can extend, uh, expand the student's sentences and model them and have them repeat back to you what they said to give them that practice. And then, you know, keep them on topic, let them talk about what they want to, but try to pull them back when you can. And here is a video of it. It's a really good one, but we are running out of time. All these videos are on the website. So if you're curious to see them, uh, definitely go to that uh, ECV website and you'll see that uh, example right there. So extension activities, there's two different kinds. We have the drill and practice, which is explicit, and the conceptual, which is implicit. And those drill and practice, Activities are repeated opportunities for practice. As many times as you can use the word, say the word, and as many times as you can get the student to use and say the word, both receptively and expressively. The conceptual activities are extending the concepts, making deeper understanding of the words and deeper understanding of the meanings in a more incidental, authentic kind of way. Uh, and you wanna provide lots of opportunities to use those words in context. You have to be deliberate about it. You have to think about what you're gonna say to students. It's really helpful, especially with the conversations and the conversations that you could potentially have with these extension activities to kind of script it out sometimes. You obviously can predict what the students is gonna say, but you can certainly write out some ideas of what you can say and what you might say to the student in response. So here's examples of drill and practice. Again, nothing that we created, right? These are all things that you're using with your students, maybe your own children. Memory, bingo, go fish, slapjack, headbands. The list goes on. You have hundreds more of ideas that I, we would love to hear that you could use for a drill and practice type activity. We happen to have an ocean theme memory game, which we were lucky to find. And then conceptual activities can be arts and crafts, uh, role playing, science experiments. Uh, we did a BATS unit and uh, we read Stella Luna. And one of the activities was just to taste a mango and kind of talk about what it tasted like and to cut it and to feel it and to you know, drink the juice. And, and that simple. You want to create an, uh, an activity that isn't getting the students looking down and coloring and cutting, but rather looking up and engaging in a conversation the activity is just a platform to have another conversation. And these were some of the ocean theme activities that we did. They tasted salt water and did some salt water paintings. So this is an overview of what a unit might look like. We designed it with a couple situations in mind. One, an itinerant teacher who might work with a student 30 minutes a day, four, three or four or five times a week and this could happen over two or three weeks, or as a center in a language arts reading block that you could pull students to work with you or a paraprofessional for 20 minutes of the day. And this is just a suggested uh, schedule of how you might be able to do all of those components, starting with day one from screening and ending on the last day with a post-intervention assessment to see how many of the words they know and, and how much of the definitions and meanings they now know. Like I said, uh, when you're implementing a vocabulary unit on our website, we've got 14 sample units that are ready to go. All you have to do is print out those pictures and follow our procedures in the lesson plans. 
or you can develop your own unit. And we've got lots of templates and helpful resources to help you do that. This is an example of one of our already made uh, units, the one obviously for ocean. And we provided you with the common core standards for uh, sometimes science or social studies, depending on the theme. So when you're planning a vocabulary unit, you wanna choose a theme. You wanna pick two books that are related to your theme. Um, at least one should be expository. Uh, you wanna select the words from the books. If you can find a word that's in both books, even better, because they're gonna have more exposure to that word. You wanna create child-friendly definitions. You wanna create picture word cards, and whether you put the word and or the definition on it is your, is your choice, but there should always be a picture. Thank you, Google Images. Um, you need to make those known words for the fast mapping activity, and you only have to make them the one time, and then you just keep using them again and again and again. You have to create car questions for each book reading. So in the end, four competence, four abstract, and four relate questions. Uh, you want to develop three conversational prompts, two drill and practice activities, and two conceptual activities. And then, like I said, it's really helpful to create scripts for the conversations that are going to happen during conversation, as well as during the conceptual activities. Here are some resources for you. These are some of the child-friendly definition websites that we use, and then also a, uh, a website that you can find sign-related signs to help you with those more uh, tier three uh, ASL signs for science words. So the takeaway message from today's uh, TA Live is that vocabulary can be caught, but it should also be taught, especially to our deaf and hard of hearing children who we know are not always incidentally learning a lot of the vocabulary early on or even uh, as they progress uh, through the years. So successful vocabulary teaching for young deaf and hard of hearing children involves purposeful planning. You really have to be very purposeful and deliberate in what you're choosing to focus on and how you're choosing to do it. And so I'd love to hear from you how you think you might be able to use some of the components of the intervention with your students. Um, it's great if you can use the whole package, uh, but if you aren't able to, or it's gonna take you time to work up to that, it's always great just to even start with some of the pieces. So uh, if anybody wants to share. Some we only have about two minutes left before we're gonna lose our cart. <laughs> okay. So I have an opportunity for you. Uh, first of all, if you want to see the same exact uh, presentation and you're in Florida and you're coming to the Florida Educator De of Deaf and Hard of Hearing Conference, um, I will be there this weekend representing Flagler's uh, master's program, but I'll also be presenting, I think, on Friday afternoon the same thing. So if you're like me and you like to hear things more than once, come on over to uh, my uh, breakout session and you can learn more about it. But if you wanna go in more depth and you're in the Northeast region of Florida and you'd like to come to Flagler College, I'll be doing a three hour workshop on December 6th from eight to four here at Flagler College. You get a tour of the college as part of your experience that day. And we'll, uh, you know, I'll be asking people to bring books with them so they can really create some units that they might potentially be able to use with their students. We do have one more question. I know that the number of vocabulary words we choose is dependent on the book length, mm -hmm. but how do we determine how many vocabulary words we choose? So from the research, we found that focusing on about five to eight is probably the most appropriate for younger children connected to one theme. And so if you have an older student, maybe second grade, uh, you can, you know, certainly go towards, uh, you know, eight words. Uh, I did have a master's student use this intervention with a fifth grader who was going into sixth grade during the summer, and she had great success with it. So, the, you know, we only researched the intervention with younger children, but uh, we certainly feel that it would be very appropriate to use with older students and that they would benefit. You may just have to tweak some of the things, certainly how many words you introduce and the length of the sessions uh, could be longer than 20 minutes because obviously older children can handle that. 
So, uh, but we say five to eight words for kindergarten through second grade is appropriate. And then we had a comment um, that an early interventionist provider said she thinks this would be great to even teach parents and I completely yes. agree. Yes, and so simple. So simple for parents to use at home. And if they're looking for things that they can do, you know, tell them to check out the website. Super easy to implement, uh, you know, and if anybody ever has questions, you can contact me or any of the people from CLAD. And I just posted the link for the workshop training that's going to be at Flagler mm -hmm. College in the chat too. So thank you. So I do thank everybody and thank you, Jennifer, for presenting today. I think this is great. This is one more tool we have in our toolbox that's research-based because um, we know when we are picking our interventions that they need to be research-based and it's beautiful that we have one more from CLAD um, in our tool, tool belt to um, provide you know, high-quality instruction for our students who are deaf and hard of hearing. I want to thank Ann Armstrong from Alternative Communication Services for providing our cart today and staying a couple of minutes over. Um, and I want to thank everyone today who participated in our chat and answer, asked all these really fabulous questions for participating in our TA Live. We will be back again next month. Um, we would love to hear from you what you thought of this. We want you to post on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest what you think and share the hashtag RMTCDHH and hashtag DefEd. As you know, we are a Florida Department of Education, Bureau of Exceptional Education and Student Services Discretionary Project, and all of our services we provide are at no cost to you. So to continue to be able to do that and offer these high quality webinars, we do need your um, feedback to share that with DOE. So if you could complete the survey right now, we would greatly appreciate it. And again, let me post that link. And it should also come up when you close your window. So, and we will be back again next month and actually I will be doing it and it will be keeping it accessible with captions part one. So that will be me presenting next time. And yes, the PowerPoint is already on our website. We, we changed it up a little bit this time and we pre-posted the PowerPoint on the RMTC DHH.org backslash TA live website so you can go download that now um, and it takes about an hour or two for the recording to process and once we have that we will also post the recording of this webinar and you can also go to our rmtc ta live website to get a certificate for attendance so i hope to see you guys back next month on in december for our ta live keeping it accessible with captions part one